We'll be reading Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives with, to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you, gets, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and it's in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, reveal to us your righteousness. Impress upon our hearts your holiness, your righteousness, and your glory. That we may bear the weight of glory that we may have a taste, though slightly in this present age, of the glory that is to come. And may that be our passion and our desire and our fervor, to be like you and to be satisfied by you alone. Father, I confess that we often chase after the temporary fleeting pleasures of this world that do not satisfy us, but leave us with a hollow aching inside. Father, we confess that we need you, that our righteousness is at filthy rags, and even the best of our good works is tainted with uh, enough sin to condemn us for eternity. Father, we need the righteousness that comes from Christ alone. We need to be sanctified to daily put to death the old man and to put on the righteousness of Christ. And Father, we thank you for the spirit that you have put in our hearts that leads us and guides us in righteousness. And we pray, Father, that you would glorify yourself by making us holy, and that the world would see the reason that we recreated for good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. 
In the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, we pray for your glory and for our satisfaction. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. If you stay in in the Bible in Romans chapter 6, we'll be addressing that text. On August 20th, 2012, Patrick Gould was born into a very harsh and cold world. His father wanted him aborted, and when he didn't get his way, he left. And his mother knew that she could never love and provide for him. His family tree was plagued by addiction and struggle. But on March 21st, 2013, at the Seminole County Courthouse, Patrick Gould ceased to exist. With one stroke of the pen, Judge Schoonover declared Patrick Gould to be Crosby Partica. Instantly, he was adopted into the family, adopted into our family. He had a new family, he had a new identity, he had a new future, he had a new destiny, he had a new heritage. For the rest of his life, He would become more and more of what he already was, a partika. Crosby was declared at that moment legally a partika. And with parents, Denise and I, we would love him and guide him and teach him and discipline him that he would be more and more of a partika each day of what he already was legally in the eyes of the law, he was a partika. He would embody our family identity. He would begin to reflect our family resemblance. He would enjoy the family privileges of being a partika, whatever that means, but he would be part of our family. And each day, our little squirt of a three-year-old is becoming more and more of a partika. Already he is fully a partika, being formed and molded and becoming the, in the family resemblance. Ocean Park, Crosby is a little reminder of what we are. As Christians, those who are in Christ, who faith is in, in Christ, have been called We have been regenerated, we have been justified, and we have been adopted by our Heavenly Father, the work of God from beginning to end. We have been brought into the family of God. We stand before God a full child because of the work of God. But we recognize that each day we still struggle with sin. The sin that so easily entangles us. And it's our Heavenly Father that is working in our lives. He's working in our lives not to make us just more and more of what we're not. He's working to make us more and more of who we are in Christ. Because we are in Christ, the Father is working to guide us and love us and sanctify us and make us look like Jesus. And that is the beauty and the joy and the encouragement of sanctification. That God, in his righteous degree, from his work, from beginning to end, top to bottom, he has declared us his children. That cannot be changed. As in as Crosby, all of his days he will be my son by decree of the judge just as Anna and Andrew are my children, because in the eyes of the law they are my children. But each day that relationship is growing deeper, and I'm guiding and loving and teaching him, just as I am teaching my other two children. Sanctification in the life of a Christian is not what we're doing to make ourselves better. It's what God is doing 
in us to make us more like our heavenly Father, to look and act and think and to reflect the glory of our heavenly Father. That is the beauty and the joy and the encouragement of sanctification. Because often, I don't know about you, but often I try to do, I got to be good, I got to do good things, I have to go down my list of things that I need to do to make myself worthy. But in reality, it's not about what I have done, it's what God has done, declaring me his child, justifying, and he is working in me to sanctify me. And now, because I have been loosened from the constraints of sin, I am able to cooperate with him in that. The active participation, participant in sanctification is God, but now I am free from the shackles of sin and I am enabled to fly because of the work of my Father and I can cooperate and I can pursue holiness because of what God has done. If I am joined, or if you are joined to Christ by faith, you have been justified before the almighty God of the universe, judge, maker of heaven and earth, you have been justified, declared righteous, and received the righteousness of Christ. And if you have been joined to Christ by faith, you have been set apart. You have been sanctified or made holy before God, and he is working in you to make you more like Jesus. This morning we're going to look at two aspects of sanctification and then again as we have been doing the last few weeks to answer the question, so what? First thing we see in sanctification is the process of sanctification. The process of sanctification. And then the second thing we're going to look at this morning is the work in sanctification. The process of sanctification and the work in sanctification. Under the process of sanctification we look at the past the present, and the future. Sanctification began when you were born again. Or as we looked in the last few weeks, regeneration, the big $5 theological word, regeneration. When you were born again, the process of making you holy and making you like Jesus began. Titus 3, 4, and 5 says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. See, at our regeneration, when we were born again, when that life was breathed into our souls, like God breathed life into Adam, the work of sanctification, the work of making us not what we were, but what we will be, and what God has declared we are, that process began. I want you to notice in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, that Spencer read for us. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and what? Alive to Christ. That regeneration has breathed life into your soul. As Ephesians chapter 2 said, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You weren't mostly dead. You weren't dying. You were stone cold dead. And what has the Father done? Through the vehicle of the Holy Spirit, he has breathed life into us. And that work of sanctification, becoming holy, becoming like Jesus began. By the work of the Father. Christians, by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Christ, when he conquered death, you have now have the power to overcome and temptation and the enticements to sin. You are no longer defined. You are no longer enslaved. You are no longer held captive ruthlessly by sin. You have no, are no longer in dominion. Do not wallow in your sin. Because the power of the Holy Spirit has set you free. You were freed when sanctification began, when you were, life was breathed into your soul. When you were united to Christ by faith. There are other traditions that the reformers made, called back to scripture that says, there is no such thing as justification 
before sanctification, that we have to make ourselves holy and we have to make ourselves righteous and we have to do penance and we have to do all these things. And even as Baptists, we have our Baptist forms of penance. You say this prayer, you walk this aisle, you hold this Bible, you do your devos each day, and then you'll be holy and then you make, might make yourself right before God. But ultimately, Scripture says this, you were declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. And he is working and he is forming and he is molding you into who you already are, righteous, before him. Because of the work of sanctification, you are freed from the power of sin. Brothers and sisters, you are free. You are free from the power of sin. You are no longer held captive. Do not wallow there. Do not wallow in the shackles of your chain. Walk in, fr in freedom. But every day, as all of you know, if you're anything like me, you struggle with sin. You struggle with the battlefield of your mind, the battlefield of your emotions and actions and motivations that you know if anybody were able to, your mind was laid bare, you would be in great shame because of the sin that we have. Sanctification is a daily process of putting to death that sin that remains in our fleshly, tainted, fallen bodies and becoming more and more where we put off those dirty, soiled garments of our flesh and put on the righteousness of Christ, the holiness of Christ. Notice in verse 12 of Romans chapter um, 6, let not, and you notice this is, this is a command. This is a um, imperative for you all, you English grammar people. The Lord has given you a command. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Why? Because in verse 11, you're, you're dead to sin. The work of God has, has brought life into you and you've been freed from the sh shackles of sin. So now you are able to do right. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Before Christ, we could had no way to fight the temptations. We, did, we sinned and we succumbed. We had no defense against that. Verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of righteous, of for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members, the parts of your body, to God as instruments to righteousness. In the past, we had no control and no power to overcome sin. And each day we gave ourselves over to sin. But because you have been freed, because you have been freed from the bondage of your sin, because the Holy Spirit of God is living in you, you have the ability now to overcome the pull of gravity of sin because of the law of the Spirit or the law of aerodynamics that allows you to fly. And now you are continual process of saying no to the flesh and saying yes to Christ. Christians, you are not saved by your good works, but you are saved for good works. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Lay aside as we run with patience this race, lay aside every weight in sin that what? Clings so easily to us. You cannot run a marathon with a backpack and, and things that are clinging. You need the freedom to run. And sin is what clings to us. And it says, lay aside those weights and strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we lay aside that sin and we strive to be like Jesus. Ephesians 4, put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in your spirit of your minds in what? Put on the new self, Christ created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Ultimately, in sanctification, in this process of being made holy, you are not making up your own holiness and finding a holiness within yourself. In sanctification, you are now bearing the fruits of the union with Christ. And let me give you an example. A branch... If you walk to a tree, a branch of a tree does not have life in itself. 
Where does the life come from? The life comes from the roots and the trunk, and that brings life to the branches of the tree. And what happens? The branches of the tree bring forth fruit. That branch in and of itself, if you remove it from the tree, it will lie and die. Even if it had was once lush with leaves and flowers and, and, and apples and fruit, if you remove it, those things will die. In sanctification, you are united to the Spirit. You're united to Christ. And His righteousness flows from you and through you and bears fruit. Don't think that you have to come up with a righteousness on your own. It is Jesus' righteousness that is being sent through you. Every day that we live as brothers and sisters who are in Christ is a continual process of putting to death the old man and investing our time in Christ. We are freed from sin, but we are being transformed into the likeness of of Christ. Every day we're becoming more like Jesus. We see our past, we see our present, but there is also a future. This is the glory and the promise of the gospel for us, that it, as long as in this life, sanctification is never complete. We may become more like Jesus, but on this side of eternity, as long as we have these sinful bodies, we will not be free from the entanglements of sin. As long as we live, we will battle sin. Some of you are more mature and older. And you can say, though the temptations of my teens and my 20s are different now in the later part of my life, I still struggle with those. And the struggles that I had back then are not as severe, but they're different. I still struggle with sin in every part of my life. But I know that at this point I've become, I'm not who I was and I'm not who I will be, but every day I'm being transformed into the likeness of Christ. There will be a day when our souls are freed from sin. When we die, where our soul is ushered into the presence of the Lord and it is free from sin. We know this in Revelation, it talks about there no sin will be in the presence of the Lord. And when we stand in His glory, we will no longer have the hindrances and be tainted by sin, but we will be free. And when Christ returns, our bodies that now are weak and susceptible to sin will be purified and glorified and resurrected when Christ returns. That is the promise of the gospel. Philippians 3 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lo lowly body to be like His, Christ's glorious body by the power that enables him even subject all things to himself. There will be a day when our bodies are no longer riddled with pain and sin and the, the, the treachery of this world. It will be glorified as Christ's body was glorified as we saw in the garden. The process of sanctification has freed us from sin, is being tra and transforming us into the likeness of Christ every day. And there's a promise that we will be completely freed from the sin that touches our souls and our bodies. We see the process of sanctification, but we also see the work of sanctification. It is incorrectly understood that God justifies and adopts and regenerates, but I do sanctification. Not according to Scripture. God is the primary agent in sanctification. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's on 988 of your pew Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The final few verses of that book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And may the God of peace himself, what does it say? Sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the hope of the gospel in 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. 
We can trust the hope of the gospel, not because of what we do and how good we are and how much we make ourselves into being nice and good and shiny and moral. We can trust the gospel because of who is promising it us. God the Father does not lie. And he is working. He is the one that is working to make us blameless. He is the one, our Heavenly Father, who disciplines us, who leads us, who guides us, who convicts us of our sin, who equips us to be able to battle sin, and who is working in us to produce holiness. The Holy we are not the ones that, uh, let me say this again. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings forth his fruit. It's not us who bring forth his fruit. We're not the ones who are producing our own righteousness. We are the ones who are united with the vine. And the vine is bringing his righteousness and producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we are united with Christ. And he is working to bring out his holiness in our lives. The primary agent of sanctification is God the Father, but because we are, have been freed from sin, we are the secondary agent. We are, we are able to cooperate with our Heavenly Father. We work with our Heavenly Father to become more holy. There is a passive act, uh, aspect of this, where we trust God and we pray, Father, sanctify us. And we pray, Father, make us holy. Make us more like Jesus every day. And it says in Romans 6, 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God. Father, use me, mold me, make me. And our Father works in our lives. He is the one who forms us and molds us and leads us and guides us as we lay ourselves bare in loving trust of our Heavenly Father. And in Romans 12, it says, I appeal to you by the mercy of God to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual service. Now, this does not mean to get lazy. God's going to work in me and sanctify me. That's good. And we say stuff like, let go and let God, right? Let go and let God. That's another word saying, I'm going to be really lazy and I'm just going to let God do all the work and I'm just going to kick back in my lazy chair of sanctification and he'll work through me. No. We want to say, Father, I know my only hope in life and death is you. I, you are the only one that can make me holy, but I want to work. I want to strive. And I'm enabled to do that now. And this is the active aspect of our sanctification, where we actively flee sin. What did Joseph do at the end of Genesis when Potiphar's wife said, come lay with me? He didn't say, let go and let God. What did he do? He fleed. He fleed immorality because he knew it didn't please his heavenly father. And he went and he ran. And he pursued holiness, recognizing that my actions have uh, uh, impact on my sanctification. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians. A little a book to the left. A few pages to the left of your Bible. 981 of your pew Bibles. Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 Therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence what does it say work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure now, we understand that in all of Scripture, we realize that we're not working to save ourselves. We're not saved by our works. But we work out our salvation. We work out, we have a part in our sanctification to play. We're not earning our salvation. It is already accomplished in justification when he looked at the cross and he, and he poured out the wrath of God on Christ. But we're working out our holiness. We're pursuing God. Where, as Scripture, and this is where all those imperatives, the commands of Scripture, are talk about working out our salvation. In Hebrews, we strive for our holiness. 
We abstain for immorality in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Corinthians, we shun immorality. 2 Corinthians, we cleanse ourselves of every defilement of our body and spirit. And how do we do that? We don't just kick back in the lazy chair of sanctification. We're active in this, in pursuing. We're running. We're going towards that goal. Bible reading and meditation. We do that discipline. Father, we're reading scripture so we can see you and that scripture will reveal our sin to us and then we can put that scripture to death and it reveals who you are and we can put on the likeness of Christ. We pray to, as a part of our sanctification. We make worship a priority. Why do we come to worship on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings on Wednesday? Not because we're trying to be holy and check it off and that, oh, that's going to make me a little holier. An hour in church gets me that much closer to my goal. No, we come to church because it is the reading and the singing and the teaching of God's word that reveals who God is. And we want to be like God. We want to get rid of that old man, our old nature. We make disciples. We go, we baptize, and we teach. Christian fellowship. We come around other brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to be loved and encouraged and protected. We don't just have fish fries because the fish is delicious, though it is delicious. We have fish fries so we can sit under a shade tree and talk about our lives and see what's going on, see how we can pray for one another, see how we can encourage one another. That is fellowship. That's why we do it. And then also self-discipline and self-control. Why? Because we want to be more like Jesus. And that is our pursuit and desire. Just like an NFL player wants to win that Lombardi trophy, so he trains and he lifts weights and he runs and he hits and he tackles. Why? Not because he likes doing those things, because he wants to be able to stand on that stage when the confetti is flying and hold up that trophy. We want to be like Jesus. So we strive and we search and we, the scriptures to see Jesus so we can come and put ourselves under the authority of Jesus. We are both passive in saying, Father, use me, mold me, make me, and we are both active where we seek the Lord. We can say sometimes when we're not passive, it's all about me, it's all about what I do, we become proud and we overly confident in ourselves. I'm making myself holy. And we pat ourselves on the back. But at the same time, we can say, God, it's all you. Let go and let God. And we become lazy Christians. We're both active in our sanctification and we're also passive in our sanctification. But ultimately, the work of sanctification is the work of God in which he enables believers to join. And we want to. We want to know Jesus better. And that's why... He's, Jesus says, if you love me, what? You'll do my commandments. Why? And it's not burdensome. It's a desire. We want to be like Jesus. We want to please Jesus. So we do those things. It's not just a, oh, you're making me do this. Like I tell my children to go make their bed. And oh, not, my, not these two, Crosby. He's not here. Ultimately, sanctification is an increased effectiveness in the, ki in the kingdom. It draws unbelievers when they see us being like Jesus. We enjoy the pleasures of God. We have a greater heavenly uh, a reward. We have a deeper walk with Jesus. And being more like Jesus brings us peace and it brings us joy. We see the process of sanctification and we see the work of sanctification. But then ultimately the question is, so what? What does it matter? What is this sanctification, this purifying from sin, becoming more and more like Jesus for the believer, for the nominal Christian, and ultimately for the Christian? For the non-believer, I say, turn from your wicked ways. As Spencer, the final verse of Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We cannot be righteousness. We cannot be right with God. The best, most charitable, most sacrificial living that we could possibly do is filthy rags before the perfect righteousness of our Heavenly Father. 
If you do not know Christ, if you have not put your faith in Christ, you are not safe. Your sin, your, it, scripture says you are a sinful rebel who is fly, fighting the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. You will not survive. Lay down your sword. Surrender to his charge, to his dominion, to his authority. Bow your knees before Jesus Christ. He is your only hope in life and death. He, as scripture says all throughout from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 21, God promises the wrath and God promises his full judgment. But always, God offers his mercy. If we fall at the foot of the cross and say, nothing in my hands I bring, only to your cross I cling. Our righteousness is nothing. We need the righteousness of Jesus. Turn and be saved. To the nominal Christian, to the, as I've called in other weeks, phony Christian, cultural Christian, you name it, whatever. The person who's trying to be moral. I want to be moral. I want to raise nice, moral, well-behaved children who don't embarrass me when we go out in public. I want to be good and I want my neighbors to think I'm a good guy or a good lady. Your good enough is not good enough. The reality is if you're trying to produce your own holiness and to be better than the guy next door so God will look at you at your funeral and say, eh, they weren't that bad, so ah, I'll let him to heaven. Ultimately, you're trying to be good on your own without the power and infusion of the righteousness of Christ is to spit in the face of the righteousness of the holy God of the universe. If you're trying to be a better you or have your best life now and to have be released from the negative thinking of this world and you're not trusting in the righteousness that comes from Christ alone, that, my friends, is why you fail. You might pull it off for a couple minutes, but your hearts are sinful. My hearts are sinful. We need an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness that can only come from Jesus. You only can trust Christ in his righteousness. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 speaks to those who are trying to do it on their own. To be moral, to be righteousness, to be good citizens and not trusting in Christ. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare them, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of lawlessness. Without the righteousness that is imputed to us by faith in Jesus Christ, we're lost. Our best is not good enough. We need the righteousness that comes from Jesus alone. You need his righteousness. You need his sanctification working in your house that only comes from Christ. Stop trying to be your own, a good person and realize that you're not a good person. But Jesus is a great savior. And Jesus gives us his righteousness and fall at the foot of the cross. Non-believers, nominal Christians, and ultimately Christians. People who say, I know I have no righteousness in my own, and Jesus is my only hope in life and death. Christ is for us, and Christ is in us. He is working. The promise of the gospel says, if you are in Christ, sin is no longer your master. Failure is not your destiny. And we see the word destiny is thrown around so much that it's just really it's weak now. But sin no longer defines you, Christian, who's been united with Christ. You don't have to wallow in your sin. It's not a choice that we have to make. You're never on this side of eternity say, I am completely free from sin. But also, you never, never, never have to say, this sin has defeated me. I give up. I have a bad temper and I've had it for 37 years or you fill in your age. 
and I will have it till the day I die. And people are just going to have to get used to it because that's who I am. That's not trusting the gospel. The gospel enables us to be free from the sin that we cannot get rid of. Whether that be whatever. Whatever sin that you know that you struggle with, that you feel helpless with, the truth of the gospel is that you can be set free from that because of Christ's righteousness. The grace of God has called you, has regenerated you, has justified you, and is sanctifying you and making you like Jesus. God can bring your practice, your life, in line with your identity as one who is joined with Christ. Do not give up hope. The gospel is greater than your sin. Sin is no longer your master, but God gives you transforming grace. Whatever you struggle with, whether it be greed, anger, gossip, pride, self-pity, lust, or envy, God's power, God's powerful grace can forgive your sin. Though often you can't forgive yourself, God's grace is amazing. And God's powerful grace gives you strength to live in new ways. Your past has been set free from the record of sin, from the guilt and the shame that you have, that you still, that you still feel weighed down. When Satan whispers in your ear and says, you're wretched, if only people knew what you're really like. You can look him in the eye and say, you're absolutely right. But my righteousness is not in my, own, in my own doing, but my righteousness is in Christ. And I know that Jesus is in giving me the transforming grace to change and to be more like Jesus and to conform me more like him. He is giving me a new heart and he's empowering me and delivering me. And I cry out to him each day, Jesus, make me more like you. And then we work and we have strength. And how do we do this? How does he transforming us and changing us? When we ask for forgiveness from sin and we ask him, ask him for his grace to change us and to transform us and set us free from the sin that we feel that we have been overloaded from. God's grace is greater than your pride, your envy, your hatred, your bitterness, your addictions, and your revenge. Romans 5.20, the truth of the gospel, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And here's another truth. You're not alone. Christ is with you. But all those who are in Christ, you can look around. All these people who love Christ share the same Heavenly Father. And we're brothers and we're sisters of one Heavenly Father. And Hebrews chapter says, let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works. To prod us and push us and to make us more like Jesus each day. We don't walk this journey alone. We walk with brothers and sisters who are loving us and guiding us. Share your burden. Now, clearly don't air out your dirty laundry in front of everybody. But find somebody who you know and you can trust and say, brother, sister... I'm struggling with sin. I want to be like Jesus. Will you help me? And it's that time where they put their arm around you and say, absolutely, I want you to be more like Jesus. And we share our burdens and we love one another and, and correct one another and guide one another in this journey. And ultimately, it is the results of the grace of God in this process of sanctification, becoming more of who we are in Christ, is a beautiful and a joyful thing. I know when I look at the life of my son, and I, I am still amazed that this little boy, just three years ago, was not related to me, not connected to me at all. And by the grace of God, he is now my son just as my other children are my son and my daughter. And I think it's amazing. And infinitely greater is the reality. I once was lost, but now I'm fine, found. Was blind, but now I see. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, cleanse us. 
purify us, transform us into the image of Christ, that our lives may be lived to the glory of our Father in heaven, and that we could be more and more like Jesus each day. Until you call us home, or till you return, here in the cross of Christ we stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.